Uh, first of all, I would remind everybody to please uh, put your phone on, either switch it off or put it in the silent so I can check mine as well.
The very next day, the 2nd of July, his parents, Padma Vibhushan Pali Sam Nariman and his late mother, Vepsi Nariman, were awarded the iconic Zarathustri Award at the 12th Zoroastrian Congress Award Ceremony. The award to Padma Vibhushan Pali Sam Nariman and his late mother, Vepsi Nariman, was received on their behalf by the Grand Court of Pushin, who is Goitan and Tanaya's daughter. Incidentally, Padma Vibhushan is the second highest civilian honor in, 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 in India. The 93-year-old Padma Vibhushan Pali Nariman is a, designa is, a, is a designated senior advocate of the Supreme Court of India and was elected president of the Bar Association of India from 1991 to 2010. He has served in many capacities and received several honors in India internationally. I should mention when Justice Royton entered through our door, those few people came up to him and introduced us, ah, your father did such and such case, fought such and such case for us. And incidentally, uh, we all know because of COVID that in the Tower of Silence, uh, it was difficult to consign the body for quite some time and uh, sort of Advocate Fali Narsam Nariman was one of the key people instrumental in persuading the Supreme Court of India to overturn that sort of edict. And now, of course, with special, uh, special sort of amendments in the Tower of Silence in Mumbai, Ahmedabad, Nostalgia, and other places, the Zoroastrians have passed away sadly because of COVID. Their bodies can be consigned there. Previously, they had to be cremated. Late Vepsi Pali Nariman was President Emeritus of the Delhi Commonwealth Women's Association. She was also the author and several of several popular cookbooks in Parsi cuisine. And incidentally, when I was a student quite a few decades ago in university, Vepsi Auntie's cookbook was one of the few Parsi cookbooks available in UK bookshops at that time. In the late 1990s, ZTF was honored to welcome Pali and Vepsi Nariman at the Old Zarathustra House in West Hampstead, where Edward Pali spoke of the Gata of the Zarathustra. Today, we welcome the equally remarkable son, Justice Royton Nariman, who will enlighten us on Zoroastrianism in other world religions. Thank you. Thank you, Malcolm. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Very, very nice to be here with all of you. Thank you. Thank you. 1879 was a very interesting and important year from our point of view because the Cyrus Cylinder was discovered in that year. Now, all of you must have heard of the Cyrus Cylinder. I told it was an exhibit here in the British Museum. And it is important because it spoke of a king who lived some 2,500 years ago. This king said that he entered Babylon not as a conqueror but as a liberator. This is important. So the first part is as to how he bows to their god Marduk. He doesn't impose his faith on them. And in the second part he speaks of the ill that was done by Nabonidus who was the previous emperor. And then he goes on to say that I have done a lot in terms of restoring the people back to their faith, back to where they were before Nabonidus came and interfered with them. And of course that I have done certain, I have repaired walls, etc. But the important thing of this cylinder is that it tells us a lot about the, the kind, of, kind of man Cyrus was. Now, Cyrus obviously prayed to Aura Mazda as we all do. You don't find any mention of Aura Mazda in the cylinder. Now, who is Aura Mazda? And who coined the expression Aura Mazda? For this, we need to go straight back to the Rig Veda as a start. Because in the Rig Veda, we have a number of speculations as to what is God, who is God, etc. The last mandala, that is mandala 10, speaks of some very interesting speculations of the Godhead, so to speak. In 
the chapter 71, you are, you are, you are introduced to a smithy with a bellows called Brahmanaspati. And this form of God blows breath into mankind and thus creates life. You are also told about a lady called Aditi and another lady called Daksha and how Daksha and Aditi produce each other. And finally Aditi produces eight Adityas, seven are solar deities who are immortal. The eighth is called Markanda, that is that which is born in order to die and that's mankind. So we have that interesting speculation. If you move on to chapter 81, you have Vishwakarma which is a kind of great architect who is fashioning the universe. In verse 90 or chapter 90 which is the most interesting, you have the famous Purush Shukta where the universe is like a cosmic man. So we have all these very interesting speculations and three quarters of that cosmic man is in the heavens, only one fourth is on earth. From the top part came the Brahmins, the caste system is set out in detail. From here came the Kshatriyas, from the knees etc. came the Vaishyas and of course from the feet came the Vursafs. So you had this, then you had the Hiranyagarma, which was the cosmic egg in chapter 121. And finally you come to something like Auravastha in 129 which says that one existed by himself. The concept of an uncreated being. Very interesting. And it existed by itself when there was nothingness and there was not even nothingness. So it existed by itself. First came desire and from desire came the gods and from the gods came mankind. And then it ends on a very enigmatic note which says that perhaps the gods in heaven know from whence it came, perhaps they know not. Now this was the milieu in which Zarathustra was born. Zarathustra, breaking with tradition, breaking with all these gentlemen with speculations about the other world, specifically tells us that he has been given a revelation. So that is what places him apart from all these other gentlemen. All of them have been speculating on their own. Here he says, nothing has come from my mind. It has come from an outside source. That outside source is Ahura Mazda. By the way, Ahura is a Vedic term. Asura, meaning big lord. Mazda was coined by him. Mazda is broken up into two words, which mean majestic, great, creator, Dias creator. So the Lord who is the great creator, who has created everything. Now for the first time therefore, you have in his Gathas and he tells you that this is for the first time. Nobody else has got this revelation before. For the first time, this God has revealed himself to Zarathustra. Called upon him because there is so much rapine and so much horrors going on in the world that he has been sort of sent here to redeem it and to tell mankind why they were born here and where they are going. So Zarathustra comes. Zarathustra informs mankind for the first time about a heaven, a hell, a judgment day, a resurrection, all ideas that you find in later world religions. Now, the object of this lecture is not to dwell on what exactly Zarathustra said. The object is to tell you as to how this minuscule community to which Zoroastrianism now is reduced has actually influenced so many very, very huge world religions, including Christianity and Islam. But we begin with Judaism. There are seven books in the Old Testament. By the way, the Old Testament has 39. There are seven books in the Old Testament which directly deal with the Persians. The first is Chronicles, which speaks of Cyrus having been brought down on earth to help the Jews. The next is the detailed one in Ezra. Ezra was a prophet and a scribe in Israel. And 
Ezra tells you that King Cyrus came down on earth in order to set the Jews free from Babylon. Now we started with the Cyrus cylinder. The cylinder says nothing about Jews. But it does tell us that Cyrus's mind was the kind of mind which said that I believe in freedom first. And those who are enslaved must be set free. So at least we know that the Babylonians who were made to follow Nebuchadnezzar's religion were given back Marduk and were given back their lands, their temples, etc. So Ezra now tells us that the same Cyrus did something even better for the Jews. Because the Jews were persons who were conquered by an emperor called Nebuchadnezzar. And the first temple that was built thousand years before Christ by King Solomon, David's son, was utterly destroyed by Nebuchadnezzar. And the Jews were enslaved and taken to Babylon. Now Cyrus comes, sets them free, and does much more. He promises them, not only that they will go back to Jerusalem, but that he will build their temple for them with Persian funds. Cyrus goes, Cambyses comes, his son, Egypt gets annexed and becomes part of the Achaemenian Empire. And then finally, Darius the Great comes. Now, Ezra tells us that in Darius the Great's time, we had Jews who are petitioning the emperor and asking the emperor, what has happened to King Cyrus's promise of rebuilding our temple? So Darius says, if King Cyrus made such a promise, I am bound to enforce it. Please show us the decree. So everybody hunted for the decree, somehow it was found. And once it was found, Darius promised them that yes, I will do this. Ezra records it. And in point of fact, it was done. They say it was done in Darius' the sixth year. They give you the exact time as well. So you have the second temple of the Jews, which ultimately was destroyed in 70 AD by Titus, who happened to be a Roman emperor's son and then a Roman emperor himself. <laughs> this second temple was built directly from Persian funds. Also very important, the Jews at that point of time were ruled by the, the Achaemenians for about 200 odd years. And the result was that because of this kind of background, there was a split down the center. Not the kind of split we see today, because today's Jews are Sephardic, Ashkenazic, etc. But these are the much, much older Jews, who are either Sadducee or Pharisee. Now, Sadducee were the Jews who believed in the old faith. Pharisees were the ones who were accused of having Zoroastrian ideas. Now, Sadducees believed in some shady place called Sheol. After you departed this life. Nothing much was said about Shell, except that it's some kind of dark place, dingy place, into which human beings land after they die. The Pharisees for the first time adopted the Zoroastrian reform and adopted Zarathustra's heaven, hell, your being responsible for your own deeds concept. For therefore, depending upon where you land, a judgment day which is the final cut off day, and then all souls be resurrected. Now, the Pharisees therefore became the Jews who believed in what the Pharisees told them. And you had this massive split down the middle. You had, of course, a third community called the Essence, who were the people of the Dead Sea Scrolls, but we won't go into them now. But what is important is that this pharisee sadducee thing continues. As you all know, the Jews started with 12 tribes. Each one was founded by a son of Jacob, who was also called Israel. That's how you get the name Israel. Ten of them had disappeared in 718 BC when the Assyrians came down like a wolf upon the fold, the Bible tells us. These ten disappeared off the face of the earth. Two living, and from those two we had modern day Jews. And modern day Jews, therefore, go back to being either Pharisaic or Sadducee. 
depending upon what they follow as to whether they go back to the old faith or this faith. So, very interestingly therefore, Judaism is the first great world religion which believes in one God to have been directly influenced by Zoroastrianism. In another interesting book of the Bible, Nehemiah, Nehemiah lived in the time of Artaxerxes, who was one of the later Achaemenian kings. You must have heard that we had three major dynasties. We had the Achaemenians which ruled, beginning with Cyrus the Great, say from around 550 BC, right till Alexander finished off the last Achaemenian king, Darius III, in 330. So they had a long route of some 20 odd years. Then you had the Seleucids for some hundred odd years. And then you had two other major Persian dynasties. You have the Parthians for about 450 years, followed by the Sasanians for another 450 years. So we are the remnants of three huge great Persian empires, which lasted for 1100 years in all. And Zoroastrianism was the official religion. Interestingly, it was never ever imposed on subject peoples, ever, except once. You had an emperor called Yazdegan II in Achaemenian times, and he forced the Armenians to become Zoroast. As a result of which, the backlash was they all became Nestorian Christians because they were forced to become Zoroast. But short of that, we have always been high-minded and tolerant of other great world things. So to come back to the Jews, we find this religion directly impacted them in the manner I have just told you. But what about Christianity and Islam? Now Christianity it impacts in two very interesting ways. You are told about the three major, I don't know whether you have ever been told that the three wise men spoken about, wise men were actually Magi, they were Zoroastrian priests. Amarhus is only a Zoroastrian priest, in all three. And all three were given funny names in the 9th century, long, long after. Casper, Melchior, etc. Balthazar, these were the three. But none of these names are here. They were given 900 years later. And what is important is that these three wise men, which is a mistranslation, from the Hebrew, which says Magoi, specifically. There were three major that is Zoroastrian priests, who being master astrologers, followed a particular star, landed where Jesus was born, came with gifts of frankincense, myrrh, and gold, your food, blessed the child, and actually said that this is one of the great socials that we will expect. Now Zoroastrianism teaches you, there are three great saviors like Zoroaster who will be born in very difficult times. They are named in fact. They are called Asvat Eretha, Ukshyat Eretha and Sosyos. The word Eretha is like the English word erect, straight, righteous. So the first is called Akshyat Eretha. That is a person who brings back righteousness to mankind. The second is called Uspar Ukshvat Eretha. That is the person who makes righteousness wax. That is, spreads righteousness. And the third is social who comes at the end of time and who has yet, yet to come. So these Magi were expecting one of the first two. We don't know whether it was the first or whether it was the second an educated guess is that it was perhaps the second because the Buddha was perhaps the first and the Buddha Jatak stories tell us that like Jesus when a virgin birth Buddha's mother was only a vessel who delivered him and perished and she delivered him by a huge white elephant entering her womb the huge white elephant is none other than Svetamai, the Holy Spirit, exactly like Jesus. So if Holy Spirit 1 
was Buddha's father, then Holy Spirit too is Jesus' father. And that's why a speculative guess on my part is that this is Jesus' Ukshyati Eretta. Aswat has already come. Important point is Zoroastrian priests were expecting a social thing. Given their studies in astrology, given their following astrology. Which is how they came, bless the child and well. An interesting postscript is that nothing is known about Jesus between the ages of 12 and 30 in the Bible. You must have noticed. Anybody who's read the Bible, the New Testament, must have realized that Jesus walks out when he's 12 and walks back when he's 30. Yeah. So you have nothing about the lost years. Now the lost years are given to you by an Aquarian gospel. Some American called Dowling Levy gets a visitation and he calls it the Aquarian gospel of Jesus. And that tells you what Jesus did in the lost years. Among other things, apparently he visited these three wise men in Persia, disputed with them on the origin of evil. Because at that point of time, which was the Parthian time, at the time Jesus lived, the current Zoroastrian belief was that when an Ariman was an all-powerful devil for the time being at least, who opposed an all-powerful God. The only difference being that the devil was not omniscient, like him. And Jesus corrects them and says, no, sorry, there is only one God. There is no such thing about the origin of evil. Evil is poor choice. Exactly what Zoroastrian taught. Much earlier. And carries on, preaches at the Jagannath temple in India, goes and learns Buddhism in Tibet, all this adventure, very interesting book. And then finally returns at 30 to conduct that fabulous ministry of two years, which now has led to so many Christians existing in the world. So we have point number one, the three major. What's point number two? Point number two is Christmas itself. Now Christmas is not Jesus' birthday. Jesus is a summer baby. In fact, the Gospel of St. Luke specifically says, when shepherds tend their flocks by night, the Savior was born. Nobody tends his flocks by night in December in Israel. They only do it in May. So we may take it that Jesus was a summer baby. How come then? The 25th December was fixed as Christmas. For this, we come to another very interest, another interesting divinity which emanates from Zoroastrians, Mitra. Now, Mitra, by the way, is an old Rigvedic divinity, pre Zoroastrian. He is an Asura, which means he is an Aura, he is described as an Aura, a big lord. And Mitra is the person who punishes those who break their contracts. So he is a lord of ethic. Now, Swarastha comes, throws overboard all the old Rigvedic divinities, including Mitra. You will find no mention of Mitra and the others. There is only one God who is worthy to be worshipped, and that one God is the creator of ethics. How does Mitra reappear? Because we are Yasas, we are Nyasas. In the Yasna Haptan Gaiti, which is the Yasna of the seven chapters written somewhat after the Gathas, we have a creeping back of all these old divinities. Because when priests went around trying to spread Zoroastrians, that is the Gathic Zoroastrians, they had pockets of resistance. And those pockets of resistance had to be somehow or the other brought in. And they were brought in by saying, all right, Mitra may not be a god, so he's no longer an Aura. But we'll make him a Yazata. So we we'll make him an angel. And therefore, Mitra now gets angelized and brought back into the Western camp. Mitra was obviously a solar deity because Mitra was fire and the sun from the fire, both. So, Mitra was worshipped. 
and much more so in Parthian times, because you find the second big dynasty has fallen. Because in Parthian times, you find a number of kings called Mitridates. That gives you an idea. You have seven of them. That Mitra was so important that you called yourself after Mitra. And there were obviously massive worships. There was a big worship of Mitra. So, we have the Parthian soldier worshipping Mitra. That much is established. At the Battle of Karai in 53 BC, you have the Parthians now fighting the Romans. And don't ever forget, but for the Persian Empire, the Romans would have gone east of the Euphrates. They were never allowed to go east of the Euphrates. Only because of successive Persian empires. The Persians stopped them at the river Euphrates. Karai is a place way beyond the Euphrates, where a Parthian general defeated a Roman one of the big triumphs, Crassus. All of you have heard of Caesar of Pompey, right? Crassus was the first to be named along with the two of them. And Crassus was the man who put down the Spartacus revolt. You remember the famous revolt of the slaves against the Romans in 73 BC. This man put it down. And he was a very powerful, very rich man. So at the Battle of Karai in 53 BC, he was defeated, killed by the Parthians. And the Roman soldier, this again is an educated guess on my part, was so impressed that they borrowed Mitra from us. Because this is the god which led to Mitra. So, 53 BC onwards, you had the Roman soldier, started with the Roman soldier, worshipping Mitra. And you have Mitraeums all over Europe. You have one in St. Paul's. Oh. Any of you have ever seen? Cathedral. St. Paul's Cathedral, just outside. There's a little thing where it's, it's about 10 feet deep because it was in Londinium or pre Londinium. Yes. yes. So you have a little Mitraeum there where Mitra was worshipped because the Romans came here, if you know. So Roman worship of Mitra then spread all over the empire. And when it spread over the empire, you had Christianity and Mithraism now rivaling each other. Constantine the Great, finally, after the Battle of the Milvian Bridge in 311 AD, accepted Christianity. And having accepted Christianity, then made Christianity the religion of his empire, much as distrust had made Zoroastrianism the religion of the old uh, empire is thus. So, we come back to Christmas. How did, therefore, Christmas become Christ's birth? Christmas was always Mitra's birth. Song Invictus, that is the invincible son who was worshipped by the Romans, was Mitra. And his birthday is December 25th because that's the lowest came of the sun. So if the sun is born every year on this day, waxes and then wanes and then is reborn every year on 25th December. And 25th December was something like the Diwali festival in India. It was the most important festival in pagan Europe. Now when Christianity replaces Mithraism, obviously Diwali had to be replaced by something. So, the equivalent of Diwali, which means Mitra's birthday, now got replaced as Jesus' birthday. Because Christianity now became the Roman Empire's new religion. And this is the interesting story of Christianity and how, in point of fact, it was Mitra's birthday with Jesus then suffer. There are a lot of other very interesting similarities between Mithraism and Christianity, early Christianity, which I don't have time to go into. Mitra also is said to have had 12 uh, apostles, which were the constellations. Mitra is also is supposed to have been slain, just as Jesus was crucified. And there are many interesting parallels which have been dealt with by many people like Franz Dumont, and Dizanakya, etc. 
So early Christianity again, especially the Eucharist again, you you have uh, you dip bread into wine, which is Christ's body and Christ's blood, was an early literary ritual. When the world got slain, and you obviously did something in the wolf's blood, because the wolf's blood then regenerated mankind and all the plants, animals, etc. So, you find that there is a direct correlation between Mitra and Zamna and Christianity, early Christianity, which has now gone unnoticed into the Christianity that is practiced today. There's a lot else to tell you, but then one must move on, because not much time. The next great religion is Islam. Now, how do we impact Islam? There's only one interesting verse in the Quran, which is verse uh, chapter 22, verse 17, which specifically speaks of magians, that is us. It speaks of kitabians. So it says, Jews, Christians, Sabians, we know Shiva, Yemen, magians and others. So therefore, the four of us are branched, are, are, are put together as kitabia, that is persons of the book. People who have a book, have, a, have an actual religion, a founder and who believe one God. So, we have medium therefore mentioned in chapter 22 verse 17. What else do we have? There are a very interesting and enigmatic chapter called the Kiel in chapter 18. It's a long chapter, and in one part of it, Moses, who was the great Jewish prophet who led the Jews back into the promised land, meets a prophet who is unnamed and who is not an Old Testament prophet. Now, please understand, the three Abrahamic religions all believe in the Jewish prophets, then Jesus, and before Muhammad, all the others, whoever else came, ending with Muhammad, they are named in the Quran. The only unnamed prophet is here. Now that's point one. This unnamed prophet lives at the time of Moses, so we get the time as well. Moses as a young man goes to him for instruction. And there are very interesting three incidents which take place. This prophet tells him that, look, you only observe what I do. Don't ask me questions. Otherwise, I'll do. So, the first time that he followed this prophet, they crossed over a particular river in a boat, and the prophet bore holes in the boat and sank. So, Moses said, Why did you do that? He said, I'll do. I told you, don't ask me, just observe. So, he begged his forgiveness, he went on, took him back. Then, incident two was a devastating incident where they found a young man sitting under a tree, sleeping. Prophet goes and kills him. Moses gets the shock of his life and says, What have you done? Again, told you. One more chance. The last chance then comes, and Moses now forfeits his right to follow this great prophet. That last chance is spent on some treasure being picked up and buried in a particular spot. And then the prophet tells him that you are obviously not a person who is ready to receive any initiation. But to satisfy your curiosity, I'll tell you why I did each of the three. The first thing I did because there was this king running after these poor people. And had I not worn holes in that boat, the king would have got hold of the boat, crossed over and finished it. It's because I bore holes in the boat that he got stopped in his tracks, those people escaped. Second, why did I kill that boy? Because the boy was a rotter and was going to finish his parents. All this I know because God told me. So, I was instructed by the Lord to finish him because the parents were extremely God, God, uh, God saving. And he said they would now be gifted with another child who would look after in their own. And the third, by what happened to the treasure? The treasure is some orphan's treasure, which had to be buried, reburied because otherwise somebody else would have picked it up. And when the children attain majority, 
is now approving to give you. Now, what is interesting is, after these three incidents, you have a mention of a person called Dhul Karnayn. Now, Dhul Karnayn in Arabic means two horned one. Good. The two horned one is obviously a person who is a person who has two hands, who wears two hands. And Dhul Karnayn is only explained if you read the book of Daniel in the Old Testament. Because chapter 8 of Daniel specifically now speaks of a ram and a goat in chapter 8. The two-horned ram, Daniel says, is none other than a Persian emperor. One horn is meat, the other is Persian. So it is an obvious reference to silence. This great emperor will continue to rule until he is finished by a ram with one horn, who comes from Greece, Alexander. Now, if we tie up these two things together, and a Persian emperor is spoken of immediately after an unnamed prophet, who could that prophet be? I have speculated that it may perhaps be Zarathustra. For the reason that, unlike the Jews, there is no other Persian prophet. Until much, much later, we have Mani and Mazda who come much later. But at that point of time, there was only Zarathustra. And if it is Zarathustra, and one more important indicator, this was a, a prophet who got a direct revelation from God. There was no injury interceding. We are told that in the world. Muhammad gets his message, message from Gabriel. The Jewish prophets get their message from Gabriel, Michael, etc. This one gets it directly from us, of the Almighty. Now, if you put 1 plus 1 plus 1 plus 1, finally, you will arrive not at 22, but at 4. And 4 is, it's again my speculation, that if this is Zarathustra, then Zarathustra's date also gets established. It's very important from our point of view. Because nobody really knows Zarathustra's date. 500 BC is clearly wrong, but then how wrong that? The Greeks say 6,000 years, maybe the year wasn't a year, we don't know. But we certainly know that Moses is anywhere between 13 and 1200 BC. And if it is that, then Zarathustra is dated as 13 and 1200 BC. So this is the interesting now, emanation from Islam. When we go back to Bhara, I exceeded my time by the way. No, no. Let me carry on for 10 minutes. You have two other very interesting Persian prophets who come afterwards. One comes in the early Sasanian period, the second comes in the late Sasanian period. And these are Mani and Mazda. Now, Mani is a person who says that I am nothing but a paraclete of Jesus, that means a covered prophet. And I preach the synthesis of Buddhism, Zoroastrianism, and Christianity. But the synthesis that he spoke of would turn Zoroastrianism on its head because he said there is this dichotomy between good and evil, yes. But everything spiritual is good, everything on earth is evil. Straight away, out in Zoroastrian terms. Because in the Gathas, the earth is raniosquerity. Joy in Why has God created us? To give us happiness. Darius has a very beautiful inscription at Persepolis saying, Aura Mazda created man and created happiness for him. So, this turns Zoroastrianism on its head. Anyway, Mani somehow or the other was able to impress Shakur the first, who was the second great Sasanian king. I don't know if all of you have been to Iran, but there is a fantastic statue of, no, it's not a, it's a bear's really statue in a rock, of Shapur sitting like this, sword in hand, on a huge horse, and three Roman emperors are under him, with his chief priest Tartin looking on. The three Roman emperors are uh, Julius Philippus, 
one like this. Then there's body of the third, and the third emperor who sits like this under him, and he had defeated each one of these three. So it is in his time that Mani preached, and Mani was tolerated. However, when his son and grandson came in Behram one and Behram two, in Behram's time. The Nijai was powerful enough to finish Mani off. So Mani died and actually was killed. But many Kianism continued. It was a religion which influenced a lot of people. Saint Augustine, for example, in his Adventures tell us tells us that early on he was a Manichaean. And the Cathars, Albigensians, etc., were little Christian groups, Gnostic groups, which went on into the 13th century AD were also persons who basically had Manichaean ideas. And the Uyghurs, which are one small group in Mongolia, actually made it a state religion. So, there goes money. Now you have one more called Mazdak. Mazdak now preached at the time of uh, one of our greatest Sasanian emperors, Kushul the first, Anoshirwan. And it is his father that he somehow the other convinced. And he convinced him by means of a trick in front of a fire. He would ask a question, the fire would answer. And obviously the fire didn't answer, something else answered. And until he got caught out, he became very influenced. And Kushu Anoshirawan put him down. What did he preach? He was a Bolshevik. He was a communist. And not only did he preach that you would distribute property freely, you would distribute women as well. So that if some guest were to enter your house, you had to offer your wife to it. I mean, like, there's no concept of a wife in, uh, according to Mazda. Anyway, Mazda, given these crazy ideas, didn't last very long. He was also king, and nothing lasted after. And now we come to the end of the talk. We come to the great emperor Akbar here in India. Akbar had the first council of world religions ever known to mankind, which he had in the Ibadat Khana at Fatehpur Sikri. Every world religion was represented, including the Charvaks, who are some ancient Hindu group, who are called materialists because they don't believe in an afterlife. So you have everybody in Akbar, Akbar's form. We are told through various sources that two religions really made an enormous impression on him. One was Zoroastrianism and one was Sufism. Now, Tajuddin was the man who taught him Sufism and Mayaji Rana was the man who taught him Zoroastrianism. This is way back in 1579. And when Mayaji Rana went to the court, he obviously impressed Akbar so much that Akbar had a fire burning continuously thereafter. He worshipped the sun. He adopted our calendar so that from Akbar down to Aurangzeb, you had Maha, Karbandi, Rod, Vera, Mughal calendar. And above all, Navros became the single most important festival in the country. Kapcheji Navros. So, Thanks to Akbar, we really started moving upwards, the Parsis here. Until then, we were an unknown, not quietly coming. And thanks to him and thanks to his patronage, we started moving upwards and started doing very well. I'll share one last thing with you before I end. Akbar had something very beautiful put up at his Bulan Darwaza. I don't know if you people have been to Fatehpur Sikri. There's a huge Massive gate which he put up to commemorate his victory in Gujarat called the Bulan Darwaza. And in Persian, there's a lovely saying which says, Isa, peace be upon, that is Jesus, peace be upon, said, Do not build houses upon this earth, but build bridges to the next world. For this earth is but a moment, spend it in prayer, the rest is unseen. This man, therefore, was the ultimate philosopher who gleaned what he could from all the great world religions. And when he came out with his famous Dine Ilai, which was his own faith, 
he essentially had Sufi ideas and Zoroastrian rituals in the name. Unfortunately, this remarkable faith, which has influenced so many faiths, is now down to a trickle, a few hours, who now. But it's important to disseminate this to everybody else. Because when Darius and Xerxes lost the famous battles of Marathon and Salamis, Persia lost center stage in the world. May someone bring it back. Thank you all very much. Thank you very much, Justice Naiman, for a wonderful, fluid, informative lecture, which has given us a lot of food for thought. And thank you very much for sharing your knowledge and also very analytically put as a true judge trying to ascertain information to then narrow it down to what it should be and draw a conclusion. The aspect of Meher or Mithra, I think, yes, it's very important. And in the classic case, I think it's not only in Zoroastrianism, but all other religions or ideas towards political thought, philosophies, where you get a central person coming and promoting or preaching a specific idea. But then his followers or her followers have to make amends and make compromises because in the real world you do have people of what we call the old school or the old guard they have to make amends with the new thought and the radical people. And this is how, in a sense, Mitra, the prominence of Meherism came about. And I think if those amongst you who read Professor Boyce's book, Zoroastrianism, Their Religious and Belief, part of which is a very clear how Mitra took an important stage after Aurobis. That's a very important thing. And how Cleverly, the, the kings of ancient, the Archimedean king of ancient Iran, together with the then Mobeds, came to a compromise with the leaders of the Mithraic religion of that time. And I think there's also another one, I think in the turn of the 20th century, the famous memorial volume to Karshati Arkama, which also talks about how the calendar developed and how Mithra plays an important stage in that but everything under our master. And this is something, as Justice Nariman rightly said, is what the key contribution of Zarathustra is to human society, is this idea of a majestic creator who encompasses everything. I think I'll open it now to questions. So if I can just request... Uh, Have you had enough of this? No. <laughs> no, sir, we have not. Sorry, guys. If I get the question, I know some of you have got, I know some of you have got a loud voice and do not use this mic, but I would encourage you to speak in the mic because you've also got people listening to this lecture online, not only in this country but abroad. So, spend time, please. Good evening, everybody. Good evening. Good evening, sir. Thank you for coming and giving us more wisdom. I wanted to ask you about the calendar you said Akbar was following. Are they currently following that calendar? And is that the Pasli calendar you're talking about? Uh, I told you it carried on till Aurangzeb. So it was not after Aurangzeb. But the Nizam of Hyderabad, as a satrap of the Mughal Empire, continued with this calendar. So that even till, let's say, the early 1900s, if you find a date uh, in the Nizam's dominions, you will find it exactly as you find out. Next question. Yes, sir. Uh, 
question? Sorry. Lucy, would you like to ask a question? Sorry, let me see. Yes, very much to the board. No, please speak it because others can listen. Hello? Yes. Uh, thank you very much for your knowledge. But uh, as I come from India, I have learned more about Vedas, you know. So you have not given any comparison with Vedas. is supposed to be the oldest in the Hindu's religion. So what comparison have you got with the Zoroastrians? I didn't compare the Vedas. In fact, I said, Zoroaster emanates from the Vedas. He comes out of the Vedas. And for the first time declares that there is only one Aura. The Vedas had several Asuras which are Auras. Like for example, Vitra, Varun. He now says, there is all these Auras are out. There is only one Aura. That Aura I will call Mazda. And Mazda alone is the great creator. So that's why he says, I am the first ever to have been appointed by Mazda to give you this revelation. In contrast with all the great seers of the Rigveda who came out with speculative theories, as I told you. Thank you. Uh, I think Lucy would like to make a comment. Discourse 
uh, and it will now be pressured. It was Justice Nariman together with Dr. Sanaya Nariman will be staying for dinner afterwards. Um, well, all that remains me to say is, of course, thank you very much for coming here today. We will have a meal shortly, and so we will have, before that, we are going to have drinks and refreshments. As uh, the Justice very nicely asked me, what are we going to have immediately afterwards? So of course, like a good Parsi style, we will be having those drinks, you know, and doing salamati. Uh, but I think it will be miss, miss of me if we did not recognize and appreciate our speaker for coming today. Jet lag as that speaker is. Jet lag as that speaker is. But you will not notice it by the dynamism and without notes, because I said it's a phenomenal memory. So congratulations. And I think I would, what I would like to do is present a few gifts from the association as a remembrance from us. And I would first of all like to request of a trustee, Rusi Dalal, and our Vice President, Behram Kapadia, to come forward to uh, present a few gifts on our behalf. Yes, can you take some photographs? First of all, Just like to present to Justice Nariman one of our sesquicentennial medallions, which the first one was presented to when His Royal Highness, the late Royal, His Royal, His Royal Highness, the late Prince Philip, Duke of Edinburgh, visited us in 2011 for our sesquicentennial. And as a gift, we would like to present our sesquicentennial medallion to Justice Nariman. If I can request our trustee, Lucy Dalal. If I can then request uh, our Vice President, Behram Kapadia, to present this volume of book called The Everlasting Flame. Zoroastrianism, History and Imagination. And many of you visited that exhibition back in 2013. You remember at SOAS that uh, it was a brilliant exhibition for the very first time in the West. An exhibition only on Zoroastrianism was ever curated. And it increased our footfall by tens of thousands who came and visited this exhibition. But it would not have happened, of course, without the ZTFE and our donors and well-wishers making and generating the first 100,000 which are co-funded is. So if I can request Behram Kapadia. I would now like to request our secretary, Roentgen Munshi, and our joint secretary, Jasmine Soral, to please come forward together with our social secretary, Gail Buhariwala, to present uh, Dr. Mrs. Nariwas a few gifts. First of all, if I can request Jasmine to come and present a bouquet of flowers to...
also like to invite one of our recent members, which we have co-opted to the management committee, Dr. Karishma Koka, to please also come forward and join us in this particular <laughs>
we can have snacks and drink. And followed by that, we'll have our drinks. Thank you. Thank you.